I invite you to stand as you're able. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the source of all mercy and the God of all consolation, who comforts us in our sorrows so that we can comfort others in their sorrows with the consolation we ourselves have received from God. When we were baptized into Jesus Christ, we were buried into death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Let us pray. Eternal God, maker of heaven and earth, who formed us from the dust of the earth, who by your breath gave us life, we glorify you. We glorify you. Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life, who suffered death for all humanity, who rose from the grave to open the way to eternal life, we praise you. Holy Spirit, sacred breath and sustainer of life, the comforter of all who sorrow, our sure confidence and everlasting hope, we worship you. We worship you. To you, O blessed Trinity, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. 
God of grace and glory, we remember before you today our sister, Frida. We thank you for giving her to us to know and to love as a companion in our pilgrimage on earth. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see that death has been swallowed up in the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ, so that we may live in confidence and hope until by your call, we are gathered to our heavenly home in the company of all the saints. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now we open our hearts to hear the reading of Holy Scripture. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be the Lord of both the living, of, of the dead and the living. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> the second reading is from Romans chapter 8. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angel, angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. The third reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barn. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow, is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all of these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need 
all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. This is the gospel of the Lord. The fourth reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishability, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When this perishable body puts on imperishability, and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Today, I want to share a sermon written by my grandfather, the Reverend John E. Chris, Jr. He shared it on Easter Sunday on April 3, 1983. I made a few changes to his sermon, and I offer this as a tribute to both my grandfather and my grandmother, Frida Feldkircher Christ. Sisters and brothers in Christ, Grace to you and peace from our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. That Easter morning, many years ago, when God raised from the dead our Lord Jesus, that was the turning point of the ages. That event turned our world upside down. Jesus touched both realms, heaven and earth, and in touching them, transformed them both. Because Jesus rose from death to life, both death and life need no longer be the same for us. First, because he came forth from death, you and I can now live and die victoriously. Die victoriously? Does this interest you? It should. Most of us don't die victoriously at all. We are afraid of death. It's taboo to speak of death. If you don't speak of it, I won't either. Perhaps we think that if we never speak of it, it will never come. So much do we try to avoid it. When someone we know dies, we say he passed or he went to his reward. He died? Uh Uh-uh. What is it, though, 
that makes death so terrifying? We ask ourselves, is it an awareness on our part of a less than adequate relationship with God? Call it our sin, our rebellion, our disobedience, our failure to put God first? Or is it this feeling that we feel that all is not well with God? Is it far better to stay here in life what is known than to venture forth into an unknown? What is beyond this life? How will God deal with us? No wonder we fear death. The sting of death for us is sin, but the fact that Jesus was raised means that on the cross, God dealt with our sin. So death has had its sting removed. Death has been transformed by the risen Christ. In my reading, I shared Paul's message to the Corinthians in which he said, O death, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sting? And in Diedrich Bonhoeffer's last statement before his death, he said, this is not the end, but the beginning of life. Death had its sting removed. Because of the risen Christ, you and I can die victoriously and live victoriously. Live victoriously? Does this interest you? It should. Many of us have trouble living victoriously. Death is scary, but life is too. Life can be full of joy and happiness, but life can also be fearsome, oppressive, burdensome, a drag, a bore, and a real struggle. If someone asks you, how are you doing? We often answer, so-so, or I'm all right, under the circumstances. But under the circumstances, we live not above them, but under them. It need not be that way, not since that Easter. Jesus wants to share his risen life with us. We can now be rooted in it, taste it, and live in it from its power. We can start life anew. Like a newborn child, we can begin again, today in fact. We don't have to be chained by our own desires. We can be free to be the people God fashioned us to be. We are not locked in. We can change. Jesus is alive and we can live victoriously. Jesus lives and he asks us to build bridges in our communities. We can live together as brothers and sisters, whatever our race, culture, and class may be. We can come together. It's the risen Christ who enables, encourages, and pushes us to this. That is living victoriously. We don't have to live with grief unending. Death is all about us. True, it hurts and aches to lose a loved one like my grandparents. But there is comfort too because Jesus lives. Because of Jesus, we must keep going, even when things look the darkest and there is no light visible at the end of the tunnel. Because of the risen Jesus, we can now live victoriously. So in conclusion, we can now die victoriously and live victoriously. Both gifts come to us from the hand of Jesus who died and was raised to life and who stands before us with arms outstretched welcoming us. He is risen and alive, restored from death to life, here to share with us his death-conquering risen life. Come take from his hand the bread and the wine, receive that victorious kind of existence in dying and in living. Come and greet him yourself, the crucified, living Lord Jesus Christ, your Lord and mine. Amen.
The fifth reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Gospel of the Lord. Frida shared being the youngest of five with her twin sister, Rita. Rita and Frida were born in the last week of January 1930 in Nashville, Tennessee. Frida went to Wittenberg College, and it was there at Wittenberg that she met her partner, and her husband and her teammate, Pastor John. He was studying at Hama Theological Seminary, and they married in 1951, July the 7th to be exact. So this past July the 7th, they celebrate 70 years of marriage, faithfulness to one another, love, compassion, forgiveness, teamwork, and the gift of family. I remember going to visit um, Frida and Pastor John at their apartment um, when they moved over to Taylor Glen. And I would go over and I would visit and their uh, walls were covered with pictures. In fact, they had so many pictures, the corridor leading to their apartment was covered with pictures. I'm sure there may have been pictures that were gifted throughout Taylor Glen. However, one of the things that struck me was that most of the pictures inside their apartment were of you guys. They loved you. They talked about you. They were so indeed grateful for you, for your lives. You are indeed the living legacy of Pastor John and Frida. I was thinking this morning um, that, uh, that Frida, we had kind of an inside joke, uh, Annette and I did, about uh, Frida. Because Frida... Whenever hymns were played and sung, she wanted every single verse included. So if you open up uh, the Lutheran Book of Worship or the new one, the ELW, for all the saints, there's like, I don't know, 60 verses for all the saints. And she wanted all 60 verses. I don't think there's 60 verses. I think there's probably eight. So, yeah. But she wanted all eight sung. She wanted them sung robustly. Frida loved to sing. She loved to sing. And so when we gathered this morning, um, and I was listening to Jennifer and Annette rehearse, I was like, you know, this is going to be different not being able to sing. But as I sat here, I felt the music kind of wash over me in a way that I was not expecting. Many of Frida's favorite hymns that are included in this memorial service are, of course, uh, some of mine. Um, Come Thou Fount, and It Is Well, and I'm sure some of yours 
as well, knowing your grandmother and your mother and your aunt. So I decided uh, last night as I was praying about what to share this morning, a verse came to my mind, and I thought that uh, I would read this verse from 2 Timothy chapter 1, and it seemed to resonate so clearly with Frida and with you and with her love and life grafted into Christ Jesus. So Paul writes to Timothy, and this is what he writes. Timothy, I am grateful to God, whom I worship with a clear conscience as my ancestors did, when I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day, recalling your tears. I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. And I am reminded of your sincere, your genuine you're without a single ounce of pretense faith. A faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the gift of baptism. I am reminded of your sincere, genuine, without pretense faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother, Frida, in your aunt, Frida, in your mother-in-law, Frida, and in your mother, Frida. And now I am sure with confidence deep down in my bones lives in you. We often don't often don't think of faith as a verb. We think of faith as a noun. Do you have enough faith? It's something that we quantify. But here, what Paul is reminding Timothy of is faith is a verb. It's active. It's dynamic. It's something that is alive. It's something that is passed on. Somewhat like I I think the genes, our DNA is passed on. You probably think about the way in which you believe. And of course it is personal. But our belief, the way that we believe, the way that we live out this faith that has been passed on to us, this dynamic faith, it probably looks a lot like the way that Pastor John and Frida lived it out. Because it's the gift of faith that was buried deep in her heart through baptism and is now passed on, and as Paul says, I am sure lives in you. We don't just remember Frida. We live by her faith, just as she lived by the faithfulness of Christ Jesus. So too is Frida's faith tied up with Christ Jesus, so much so that her faith which is now in you, is tied up with the very life of Jesus Christ. So much so that it is difficult to take the two apart. In fact, I don't think that's what God desires for us to do. Faith is indeed passed on, like DNA. It's passed on as we watch our parents live out their faith. Faith is taught to us. Faith is given to us as we go out into the world and watch 
as our parents, the ones who embody for us, the ones who imprint on us the very life of God from the moment in which we take our first breath, we see how they live out their faith. There was a picture that was uh, shown at uh, Pastor John's funeral. And it's a picture of Pastor John and there in his hand, clasp in his hand, is John's hand. Little John with his dad out on a march for justice. That's how faith is passed on to us. When your mother prayed with you at night, when your mother embodied faithfulness, probably dragging you to church when you probably did not want to go, when your mother embodied faithfulness to your dad, that's how faith is passed on to you. I was blown away at Pastor John's memorial service because you were the living legacy of his faithfulness. You're not a perfect family. There is no perfect family. But it is through your imperfection that the life and faithfulness of Jesus Christ and the life and faithfulness of your parents is revealed to the world. Faith is alive. The faith that lived in your mother is alive in you. The faith that was alive in your grandmother is alive in you. The faith that was alive in your aunt is alive in you. The faith that was alive in Frida is alive in me because she indeed passed it on to me, to all of us. We are legacies of her faithfulness just as much as we are legacies of the faithfulness of Christ Jesus. Luther, Martin Luther writes that faith is a divine work in us. And I love this. Listen to this. Faith is a divine work in us. Oh, Luther says, it is a living, busy, active, mighty thing, this faith. Faith is not a noun. It's a verb. It's a living, busy, active, mighty thing, this faith. And the way in which you live your faith out is not only remembrance of your grandmother and your mother and your aunt, it's a living embodiment of her life too. One of the things that struck me as kind of humorous was that your grandmother loved to sing so much your mother loved to sing so much that she wanted you to sing at your father's and your grandfather's funeral. I know there was some hesitancy, but she was like, this is what we're going to do, as if the Chris were the Von Trapp family. <laughs> One of the things I remember and cherish about Frida is that when she would come up for communion each Sunday as we were gathered in the sanctuary, she would come up not dour and sad. She would come up singing. I don't know if you remember that. She would come up singing. She would be singing the hymn, whatever communion or distribution hymn we had. She would come up singing that. And there... Beside her was Pastor John. And Frida would hold out her hands. And I remember she didn't really stop singing until she received the bread. And I'm sure she was humming as she chewed the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's something very powerful about that image of your mother and your grandmother singing singing as she came up to receive the very life, the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so as the music played this morning, 
as we heard the hymns, the keys and the notes on the piano and the strings and the notes from the cello, and as they mix together, I kind of imagine them being kind of like incense being lifted up to the heavens, that music blending and mixing with the heavenly choirs. I could hear Pastor John's voice in the reading of his sermon today, but I could also hear your voice too. I could hear Pastor John's faithfulness in the sermon this morning, but I could also hear yours. I can see Frida's faith lived out life this morning as you are gathered here. But I can also see Frida's faith-filled life lived out in each of you. So we may not be able to sing all verses or any verses today or every single stanza of all the hymns that are in this bulletin, or we, I know we were not able to put every single hymn that Frida had that she wanted in her funeral bulletin because we would be here for several days. But this morning, Frida is singing around the heavenly throne room as John the seer in Revelation says, gathered around with the four angels, and the elders, Pastor John, and the whole communion of saints. And heaven and earth, as Pastor John's sermon said, have indeed been brought together as we worship, as we gather here this morning. And so it's with our words and the songs that we're probably humming in our head that the two merge, and this becomes a place indeed, where heaven and earth meet. It's been several months since Frida died, and I know that you wanted to make sure as much family as could be here as possible. And as I was talking with Peter and Mary, I know as we've gotten closer to this memorial service, her death has become perhaps even more real than it has been. Sometimes we talk about it as closure, but I would like to talk about it as celebration. And I hope that as you go forward into the days and the weeks, the months and the years ahead, that you will remember the very faithfulness by which Frida lived her life has been passed on to you. And that that faithfulness is alive. And it'll be alive in your children's children and in your children's children's children. And it'll be alive for eternity, celebrated. And so today, we celebrate. We celebrate with Frida and Pastor John, even as we are filled with sadness and missing them deeply. We celebrate knowing that they are here, carried in our thoughts and our memories, that they are here and they are celebrated in the life of faithfulness that we live now. Amen. Let us pray. God of mercy, Lord of life, you have made us in your image to reflect your truth and light. We give you thanks for Frida, for the grace and mercy she received from you, for all that was good in her life, 
and for the memories we treasure today. God of mercy, hear our prayer. You promised eternal life to those who believe. Remember your servant, Frida, and bring all who rest in Christ into the fullness of your reign, where sins have been forgiven and death is no more. God of mercy. Your mighty power brings joy out of grief, life out of death. Look in mercy upon this family and all who mourn. Give us patient faith in times of sorrow. Strengthen us with the knowledge of your love. God of mercy, hear our prayer. You are tender toward your children and your mercy is over all your works. Heal the memories of hurt and failure. Give us grace to use wisely our time here on earth to turn to Christ and to follow in his steps in the way that leads to everlasting life. God of mercy. God of all grace, we give you thanks because by his death, our Savior Jesus Christ destroyed the power of death and by his resurrection opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Make us certain that because he lives, we shall live also and that neither death nor life nor things present nor things to come shall be able to separate us from your love which is in Christ Jesus our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God now and forever be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this For the remembrance of me. And again after supper he took the cup. And when he had given thanks. He gave it to his disciples saying take and drink. This is the blood of my new covenant. Which is shed for you and for all people. For the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And with those first disciples. 
our Lord teaches us to pray as we say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So um, I invite you to open up the top. There's a small cellophane piece. And you will see the wafer. This is the body of Christ given for you. And beneath that, you'll see the thicker tab. You can pull that back. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gifts of his body and blood strengthen, keep, and unite us now and forever. Amen. Now let us take a moment to commend Frida to the mercy of God, our maker and redeemer. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Frida. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. You may be seated.
Now we're going to uh, go to the columbarium. Uh, on the back of your bulletin is the service of committal, so uh, you can bring that out. Um, and um, out there, I'll lead you through the service of committal. Um, uh, the niche is, is open, and we will place uh, your mother's cremains uh, in the same niche uh, with uh, Pastor John. So, uh, again, um, we celebrate uh, not only her life, but uh, Pastor John's life and their life together as we remember the resurrection and the promise of eternal life in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. 